Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Klein. I'm the director of P20 initiatives here at Northern Illinois University, and I help facilitate the Illinois P20 network alongside Lori Ellis Piper, who's the Dean of the College of Education here at NIU. The Illinois P20 network has over 150 school districts, community colleges, four-year universities, all of the state agencies and other organizations that are involved in education who um, want to ensure that people in Illinois at all levels, at all age levels, at all uh, levels in their educational development can uh, continue learning in the best learning environments possible. And we have the goal alongside the state stated goal of having 60% of adults in Illinois by the year 2025 have a uh, credential or um, degree of some kind. And so with that said, we are hosting our fall meeting with a little bit different format. We're meeting over the course of four Fridays. Um, three individual topics plus one of our admin academies on a couple of hot topics joined together, and that's social and emotional learning leading to college and career readiness. That administrator academy is uh, next Friday morning, and it's a half day and online. And it's, of course, not open only to, to administrators, but people, anybody that's involved and wants to be a part of that. So um, with that said, um, we are excited to have a really great panel here today to talk about the teacher shortage. Um, we've titled this panel discussion, Recruitment and Retention of Diverse High Quality Teachers, because of course that's our goal, that we have uh, teachers from all different kinds of backgrounds who are wonderful in connecting with students and in engaging them with really important skills and high quality uh, complex content. So with that, we're gonna start by having our panelists introduce themselves and tell us who they are, what they do and where they are. Um, and then we're gonna have them talk about why, why in their current roles, um, this issue of the teacher pipeline and recruitment and retention are important to them. So to kick things off, uh, I'm gonna have our team from Indian Prairie School District 204 get us started. Brian, can I have you get things going and then we'll hand it over to Katie. Uh, welcome. Thanks for allowing us to join today. My name is Brian Jovenini. I'm the Director of Innovation for Indian Prairie School District 204. Uh, I'm excited to join to discuss. Uh, this is obviously a conversation that we're having in 204 about supporting our educators and building a, a diverse, strong workforce of teachers who are interested in joining us. So it's uh, something that we're passionate about in 204. Thanks, Katie. Good morning, I'm Katie Pop. I am the president of the Indian Prairie Education Association, the teachers union in District 204. Um, like, you know, just to echo some of Brian's sentiments, this is something that we are, uh, have a great interest in it uh, with regards to teacher retention and the shortage. Um, and we are spending a lot of time in our district focusing on how to engage our students and let them know that education and becoming an educator is a viable career for them. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Janice and then Ron, I'm going to have you guys jump in and introduce yourselves, please. Good morning. I'm Janice Jones. I am the College and Career Readiness Facilitator at Sauk Valley Community College in Dixon, Illinois. And I think one of the pieces for us in, in developing this teacher pipeline in our partnership is that uh, we have seen so many of our local teachers come from our local area. And so that whole idea of growing our own to help alleviate the, the serious need for our uh, partner districts is, is an important piece. Ron? I'm Ron McCord, a superintendent of Rock Falls High School in Rock Falls, Illinois. Um, I, I believe this pipeline and teacher retention is essential. Uh, at this point, with the shortage as it is, uh, we're losing programs across the state um, because there are no candidates to fill those vacancies. And when you don't have uh, candidates and programs get dropped, that's not good for kids. So uh, it is essential. Wonderful. And we heard uh, Janice refer to growing her own teachers. Uh, from Southern Illinois University and their implementation of the state's Grow Your Own program. Uh, Stacy, can I have you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? 
Yes, I am from Southern Illinois University. I'm a professor in early childhood. So I certainly am aware of the shortage of teachers in early childhood and the concerns that we have uh, for those uh, uh, children, you know, who are who are having to uh, work with people who may not be as prepared as we want them to be, right? As they start their as they start their school career, very critical part. So I'm also undergraduate program director in the School of Education and the director of the Grow Your Own program. And so I I'm excited to be here today to discuss this issue as it is very relevant in all areas of the state, but definitely down here, we, you know, we, we are seeing the concerns of recruiting uh, those who are from diverse uh, populations. Thank you. And then we'll wrap up with uh, folks from Northern Illinois University, Jenny and then Danielle. Hi, my name is Jenny Johnson. I am the Senior Director for our College of Education's uh, Office for Student Success. And um, our college is super committed to the idea of confronting this really national but shortage in Illinois. And we have um, come up with some innovative collaborations and um, strategies to help, help um, hopefully help help make a difference, right? And so i um, excited to have been invited to talk about that today and um, thank you. Danielle? Hello, I am Danielle Ritson. I am a student in the, in the Northern Illinois University College of Education. I specifically am not on campus, but I attend a program, the, N, the Pledge Program, which is for Elgin Community College students and basically I currently am in Elgin and we take coursework there as well as student teach there at least at my, it's at my stage of things and I think it's important because I see how the lack of people in schools can impact a child's education often you know they don't have the same resources as though they would if they had the number of people in the past and I think even in 2017 as we was pointing out numbers of like lacking folks in this field so I'm like I'm hopeful to see it grow because it's such a vital aspect of our country to, to educate our young people and give them a bright future so wonderful well thank you all so much for being here um, before we jump into the first question part of the context I, I want to give is is something that Ron had mentioned in his opening which is uh, the need for educators to be able to run a wide range of programs to meet our students' needs and prepare them for their futures. And we know in Illinois, the context is there is a lot of support at the state level uh, among politicians to continue expanding programs. There is a big effort to continue the expansion of early childhood education, but we need to have enough early childhood educators. Uh, last winter, we had legislation passed that will expand requirements for world language experiences for our high school students, as well as computer science experiments experiences. And we know we need to have enough world language teachers and teachers who can teach computer science around the state of Illinois to be able to, uh, to, be able to follow through with those new requirements. So given all of that, let's start with, why do you think uh, we have a shortage of educators today? And I'll leave this up to whoever wants to jump in first, but again, let's start there. Why do we have this teacher shortage? In, in, our, in my opinion and in conversations across our district, I think a piece of it has been the real uh, societal message that students have gotten that uh, you don't wanna go into education. Uh, as a former uh, professor of education, I know my students have come in and go, my teachers told me not to do this. So we've shot ourselves in the foot, right? Um, teachers are underpaid, they're underappreciated. This is what society is telling us. The pension issue has gotten huge headlines and all of that feeds into the understanding that education is not a viable career long-term. And I, I think that has been a real uh, issue for our students and, and perhaps part of the issue for the declining enrollment in education courses. I also think one of the other things that we've kind of encountered in 204 is uh, sometimes it's hard to really make education exciting when you're doing it, it's really easy because you get to solve a lot of problems. Uh, Katie was just on a panel yesterday and one of our technology and engineering teachers is a former engineer 
And he talked about his experience and why he became a teacher and how like all the things that an engineer does, he does in education. That's why he loves it. Um, but to kind of think back to it, to kind of promote it to a high school and middle school student, sometimes it's harder to give a hands-on experience for education. They see their teachers, but STEM was kind of a big deal and it's easy to give a STEM hands-on experience. So I know there's a lot of traction behind that. So that's one of the things that we're trying to think through of how do we get better experiences for kids to see it? I would uh, want to add on to that in that, you know, when we're thinking about experiences for people who are interested in education, it takes a while for them to get into those classes where they're going out in the field because of all the hoops that we have to jump through, right? You know, the the uh, background checks, the, you know, everything else. So we can't just throw them in in the first semester and get their feet wet early to to show them how exciting the field is and and to, you know, get them, get them um, inspired to be a teacher. You know, I also think long term, again, I'm going to hop on to what Janice said, is that the field of education is not seen as very positive right now. And I think we have to figure out how do we support our teachers better so that they have the longevity in the field and, you know, want to, to stay in that career. Because you hear a lot of people say they're only going to be in there for a few years and then they're going to get out. I think, you know, like Ron and uh, others who are in the school districts will know that better, you know, than we do. But but preparing them to be long-term teachers is is a whole other uh, you know endeavor that I think we need to work on. And I think the other thing is too, educators aren't good at promoting themselves. Um, you're the least person to want to you know likely to say, "Hey, this is you know these are the cool things I get to do." I mean, you just know that it's a natural part of your job, and you just do it, and you're here because it's something that's innate in you that you wanted to work with kids and you wanted to do this that it doesn't really always dawn on you to say, hey, this is a really cool thing. Maybe this is something you should look into doing. Yeah, to, to Katie's point, how many schools, even elementary schools have career days and, and they don't include education as one of the careers, even though everybody planning the career day is of that career. So great, great point, Katie. Ron, were you gonna jump in and say something there? Sure. Um, I, have to, I have to piggyback on what Janice said. Uh, teaching is hard work. It's underappreciated. Uh, we shoot, we shoot, and we have. We as educators have shot ourselves in the foot many times by how we talk about education with our students. But there, there is. There's a never-ending cloud of mandates. Politicians cannot leave education alone. The idea of parenting has changed. Gone are the days when you get in trouble at school and you worry about what mom and dad are going to do when they find out. Uh, and, and again, retirement benefits. Uh, you can think what you want. Um, I believe people, you know, these young kids are smart enough to understand that there's a difference between tier one and tier two in Illinois, and that is an incentive to go elsewhere. But again, it comes back to politicians getting in the way. So Danielle, you are, you are entering the profession and you're, you're obviously choosing to do that. And I'm sure you've got peers who, who you know, you went to high school with or whatever, who are not choosing to do that. What's your take on, on why we have a shortage of teachers? I mean, you're obviously going to both benefit from that, hopefully, by having lots of opportunities for a job, and you're helping solve that by becoming a teacher. But why do you think we have a shortage of teachers? I think a lot of times when I meet young people today, both like people near my age and those younger, a lot of times the jobs they look for either can relate to the money they make or how flashy it is. Oftentimes it's like, oh, I'm be a doctor. And it's like, and, and while I, and while I hope that child gets to go on and become a doctor, if that's what they truly want to do. I have that you meet young people who I do think have leadership skills that could translate well to a classroom. In like my case, like people my age. But I do think that oftentimes the flashiness of the job or the uh, money that comes with it is often what is first pushed forward. And I think that's very true that teachers, you know, we don't make a lot of money. <laughs> um, so I think that as some people noted before, it, a lot of it comes down to that. And I think something that I've seen in the classroom is like, I see that a lot of times kids, they like to meet pe young people that are different from them. They like to meet people they can ask questions. They love to ask me like, what do, what, what do you do? Like, what do you, and I'll like, I'll say, oh, I have a sister or something like offhand, like what? They're like, they're so excited to meet young people that are different than them. So I think that 
you know, this is a very, uh, very uh, interesting job, and I think a very enlightening job because you see your work every day and the young people you work with, even if it isn't a perfect grade on a test, maybe they start to have a social and emotional change, like they start to use certain, like whatever the goal is. Like. So I think that you see your work visually every day with the kids, and even if it isn't an improvement here or there, I think it's a very clear, like, oh, somewhere, somehow, my job is having an impact. So I think that that sentiment is something that it doesn't give you as many dividends financially, but it does in the sense of your feeling in your heart, like, oh my gosh, I did something today. And it, it makes me feel good that I'm like, I go home and even if it's a bad day, I'm like, at least one kid I at least was able to do this for. So it's those small wins that I think are not as easy to to like put out a screen and say, oh yeah, teachers make this much money. It's like, well, they don't, but they do so much good at, in our society. So I think that, that that dividend is not found easily, even if people in the field can attest to it as I would myself. And, yeah. and Danielle, I think, I think everybody else on the panel would echo what I'm about to say, which is just you wait until you, you meet a former student five or 20 or 30 years down the road uh, maybe someone who who struggled a little bit with being successful and you invested a lot of time in them and they're doing great. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty significant. So I think one of the questions there is how we can help people as they're considering careers kind of understand what that feeling is too and um, and maybe connect with that. I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah, I've, I've heard of some programs that actually reach into the high schools. I know I I'm trying to think of, I know I had, a, I had a program in high school that got me, to, got me connected to an actual school and I was a senior in high school in a school under the supervision of a teacher. So I think that that was a real catch for me because I didn't really know what I want to do. I was like, I want to be a nurse because that's the thing my mom had said, oh, be a nurse, you'll have a job forever. And even though I, I have great respect for nurses for what they do, I personally didn't feel any sort of, so I think like, catching kids early on if they do by like, I think there's some programs out there already that like kind of pull them in, so. There are, it's almost like I, I wanted Danielle to say that so we could switch to the next question since we've got people who run some of those programs. Danielle, that was awesome. Um, so let's shift to talking about what you think is the most important and or effective strategies that, that you're using to try and support new teachers coming into the profession, the success of, of our new teachers that we've recently hired. Um, I, I'm going to put, uh, well, everybody else on this panel uh, has experience with programs like that. So whoever wants to jump in and share uh, what you're doing, this is the moment where, where the whole state wants you to brag uh, and share about that thing that's working well. So please do. Katie, great. Go for it. Sure. So one of the programs they're working on is we're actually partnering with IEA um, with our mentorship program that they were given a grant, um, both um, IEA and IFT with regards to um, throughout the state. And so what we've been able to do is with our first and second year teachers, we've been able to provide them um, a building mentor. So they have somebody in the building that they can connect with to get to know the climate and the culture of the building and, you know, the basics like how do you actually use the copier and things like that. And then what we're also able to do is provide them with a virtual coach. And I'm also a virtual coach myself because I wanted to see what the teachers were going to be receiving. And so the nice part with the virtual coach is it's somebody who's um, more familiar with your content area and what your day-to-day -day life looks like and can help you anywhere from classroom management to your curriculum um, and just basically um, survival. <laughs> how, how do you survive that first year? Um, and, you know, a lot of the questions, you know, as we get into this year in particular, um, and as, you know, we're in mid-October, a lot of, for me, a lot of my um, mentees have been asking, how do you take a break from this job? Like, how, when, when do you, like, when's the downtime? Or, and it's, you know, so those have been our conversations around that. And the nice thing with the virtual coach also is, um, it also reinforces those Charlotte Danielson concepts. So it gives you an opportunity to work around Charlotte Danielson and the terms and the attributes that they need to become familiar with so that they can also be successful in their evaluations. So that's one of the programs that we've been working on. Uh, to continue off what Katie said is um, in 204, Katie and our um, district team, as teachers come into our district, We've tried to take a different approach and try not to give them everything at the start of the year. Like, all right, here you go. Good luck for the entire year. More of a 
as students walk in, welcoming, exciting, here's our culture, we want to get to know you. The curriculum, we'll get there, you know, let's be successful on day one, then let's do day two. And then when we talk to you in October, okay, here, now we'll start getting into these things, but really just be welcoming um, and talk about the experience they're going to have and, and kind of supportive. Jenny? Thanks. So one of the things that we're doing at NIU and in the College of Ed and Danielle is a participant in is we have a pledge program and that stands, it's actually an acronym that stands for Partnering to Lead and Empower District Grown Educators. And this program is a collaboration between NIU between and um, Elgin Community College and also uh, one of our larger districts, 246. And so we really are working to foster a pipeline where our students start the first half of the two plus two at Elgin Community College, then they become Huskies, but we bring the classes to them. So what we're doing there is, is hoping to provide the opportunities or remove those barriers for for students that might not be able to for family reasons or other reasons or proximity get to DeKalb. So we deliver all the coursework there. All of their field experiences are in the community as well. And then, um, you know, the hope is that they'll become hired within that community. And so um, our first cohort graduated uh, last spring. And um, the exciting news is that everyone that began this model graduated and became hired. So really exciting and um, Danielle is a part of our second cohort and um, all of those teachers or future teachers will be licensed elementary with ESL or bilingual endorsement. So um, really, really hoping to meet a need in a community and um, we're always working to scale up, but I'm super excited that to, to bring it back to before they become teachers, how can we support them and, and doing it in the community and, and partnering with our, with our um, other you know, our community college partners, but also community partners, also district partners, and um, hoping to really make that circle work. That's awesome. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, I'll reiterate some of the same. Uh, new teacher orientations, uh, mentor programs, being as welcome and supporting as you possibly can be, um, helping new teachers connect to the community are all good uh, strategies uh, for new teachers. And, and going back in time, because um, so many of you have experience with um, starting with high school students who think they may want to be educators. And, and I'll, I'll throw in one plug here, and that's that we have to remember when we're doing work around the career pathways, uh, one way to measure our success is by the number of students that move forward in that pathway. Another way to measure success, and this starts to become difficult to quantify, is with students who've decided that pathway isn't for them, but they've decided that much earlier than after spending four years of time and money, for example, earning a bachelor's degree, so they can, they can go in a different direction. So that is a success, harder to measure. But talk to us, um, any of you that have experiences with beginning to engage high school students in the process, um, what you do there and that's been most effective. I think one of the things that is, is essential in any high school program, number one is identifying the students. Every student thinks they know what education is about because they've been a student. And we know it's totally different on the other side of that desk. And so helping them to identify those skills, you have these skills that would translate into uh, being an educator is key. Um, and, and making that, we're really working hard to make that a culture of not just our, our school, but our districts and our communities so that uh, people will be able to say, wow, I don't know what you're thinking about doing, but you know you'd be a great teacher. And that can really be a, a real guidance for students. I think another piece um, based on how the four-year system or the post-secondary system is set up is helping students identify what grade level they're most interested in because the last thing we want to do is have a student um, you know get to student teaching and, as an elementary teacher and go uh-uh this isn't for me I should be I should be an you know uh, early childhood or I should be middle school and so giving students those experiences with different age groups uh, I, I, you know, we constantly see that that conception, students have a conception of, of what it, it's like to be a kindergarten teacher. And after they're there for a few days and they go, um, man, I don't, I don't want to 
take out boot liners, wet boot liners and put them back in and, and, you know, flip gloves. And I, I don't want to do that. That's, uh, you know, and, and thank goodness somebody does. Right. But um, that's not for them so that, so they learn those pieces, right? So maybe they don't leave the pathway altogether, but then their next experience can be uh, with older kids. So I think that is really, really helpful to help guide students. So they do that in high school before they commit to a college uh, pathway. It's awesome. Stacy. rather than talking about high school students, can you talk to us about um, the focus of the Grow Your Own program and how that engages. And then Jenny, sorry, I cut you off apparently, uh, the challenges of doing this over Zoom. But Jenny, if you want to jump in right after Stacy, that would be great. Yes, we have uh, several cohorts for Grow Your Own and uh, Grow Your Own Teachers. And uh, we are very excited. We have 17 in our uh, first cohort of SPED paraprofessionals who are getting ready to graduate this fall. So, I mean, wonderful. So we started out with 20, right? So, you know, you do have some attrition and uh, uh, but but I feel like we've had a good support system and having cohorts, I think, really helps them. Now, the other thing that we're, we've worked hard on in, and it is part of Grow Your Own, is making sure that they get professional development as part of the program while they're in the schools. And I do think that helps them because they're running into those issues as they're in their current classrooms, and then they're getting the education right there to address it. And the other thing is, is that we're working on it with our newer cohorts in getting mentors coming in, especially for those who are from minority backgrounds, because I think that they're going to encounter different issues uh, than the, than, you know, your, your regular, what we've traditionally seen in our programs. And we want to, we, I think, you know, the more successful we are in supporting them, they're going to get the word out and, and others are going to say, hey, I can do this. And so that's what we're really excited about. But the, you know, I think the big thing in making them successful is that they are currently in their classrooms and they're actually in our new early childhood uh, cohort we have one person who is in a high school <laughs> she's in early childhood that's where she wants to go but see there's a pre-k in in that high school so so that's helping her get the experiences that she needs and she's seeing that as you know that's a benefit because I think that they'll start to move her into that room too you know so I think that as many ways that we can think uh, as many creative ways that we can think outside of the box to support the students I think they're going to be more successful successful. And we're constantly checking in with them. You know, what are the issues? What do you need help in? And I love it because they're more vocal than our traditional students also. Hey, like I have an email from last night. Hey, we need some more uh, information from our supervisor. You know, we want more, you know, and I love hearing that, you know, and, and that also I'm going to push that down into our teacher ed program for the traditional uh, students and see, you know, how can we help them? Because this is what these students are asking for. And maybe our traditional students do not know what to ask for and and anyway so I think that this interaction and and the collegiality between programs and among students is going to make it a better uh, make it better in the future for what we offer Jenny did you, yeah go ahead sure please. so um what I was going to say was piggybacking off of the how we get to the students and one of the things that we've done is um participated in you know like you say that the what do you want to be days and um, I would present in like a myth buster fashion because you know so then we're in front of students who maybe never thought about being a teacher and say well did you know this did you, you know and um, kind of maybe put plant in that seed and we've gone all the way you know we've been in middle schools we've we've invited groups of um, middle school students as a matter of fact um, next Wednesday I have a group coming to campus to you know see what it's like and we do team building activities and and make it you know, showing them the other side of what they're experiencing, like you said, as students. So seeing what it is like to maybe be a teacher. And, and when you bring the whole group, you never know which ones are going to are going to catch. Right. And so that's just an approach that we're trying to get that the idea of this is the best profession in the whole world and here's why. And let me tell you in eighth grade, think about it or um, Another thing that, you know, we what we do is we, we provide many of our alum with um, alumni packets to put just proud to be a Husky around the room and, you know, get plant that seed of, 
you go there. I love you as a teacher. Maybe I'll go there and maybe I'll go to the college. Right? So just little things we're hoping to grow. And then once we have a bit of an interest and, in, you know, then it's all about the support, right? We want to, we want them to be able supported from the very beginning, their very first semester. We have, um, we do get our students out into engaged learning experiences right as soon as they walk on campus. We call it our Educate and Engage series. And so while it's not a true clinical experience, they are in a classroom and they are engaging with students at multiple levels, sometimes just a day, sometimes it's a week. Um, so really trying to, once we have them thinking about becoming a teacher, learning to love it and seeing it in multiple spaces and contexts and um, have, have them feel like they're supported in this journey. So Danielle, I'm gonna put you back on the spot. I'm sorry to do that, but as you're, as you're in this process, um, I, want, I guess I want you to think again about people that, that you went to school with prior to graduating from high school. Um, if you were to go back and, and talk to, to your high school classmates with who you are now, or, if it's the last night of the of the high school football season tonight, if you were to go to some high school and at halftime be given a microphone and say, what, what would you say to students, to high school students or to middle school students, uh, which is, is really critical. There's a whole body of research from almost 30 years ago about making kind of career pathway choices as early as sixth grade. Um, not that kids should know what they're going to do. I mean, the jobs that exist when they're in sixth grade will be different than the jobs that will exist 10 years later. Um, but but <clears throat> what are their interests and thinking about the skills they need? So Danielle, what would you, what would you say are the, the reasons that high school students, uh, community college students, other um, undergraduates at a university setting would want to hear about to consider teaching as a profession to help address the shortage that that maybe all of us that have been doing this a long time aren't saying uh, to them. I think a lot of times, especially folks who come from different backgrounds that would, you know, engage students with people that maybe don't look like the typical teacher, because I know when I go to my classes or at coursework, there is a certain type that you see. It's pretty normal and natural. But I think to engage those who maybe don't look like the typical teacher, whether it's a male teacher, a teacher of color, whatever that category might be, I think a lot of times it's being that thing that you needed when you were that age, which is kind of hard to describe in a sense, because it's kind of, I think a lot of times young people, you know, they were taught up by teachers who didn't look like them. And sometimes they, they were like, oh, I, don't, I don't, why did I look here to, to listen to you? But if they had a teacher who maybe it's a boy who he feels like his teacher doesn't get him, but if he had a male teacher who could be in that room with him or some sort of professional who maybe is like a, a para or fill in the blank or some sort of professional in the field. So I think finding that sense of like, you can look like somebody's, like they need that somebody's like aid, help or guide, whether it's the teacher or some sort of support staff. So I think representing that to a child is obviously, and I've been in the field for a while, so I mean, I got my own, my own bias. I, I, I like it a lot, but I think representing like the thing, uh, the, uh, the role model a child needs is important, especially in the day and age where a lot of young people have very negative, you know, stereotypes to lean into where they sometimes feel like, oh, I can't be smart because it goes against the social pressures I feel at like my, in my community. So sometimes like I have students who they are really good at a subject, but sometimes I get the feeling they feel like, oh, well, I, but, eh, but I'm not gonna end up doing anything big with school anyway. So I think if they had a role model who's like, yeah, well, I went to school and I was in the community like you, like it gives them a sense of like, oh, school's cool and staying in it is really even like more worth it. So I think the long-term benefit of having those faces in the room that look like our students is really monumental. So I think that representation of a role model is really important. That's a great answer, Danielle. And Danielle has, has also just said she wouldn't go out into the middle of the halftime field by herself. She'd bring a whole bunch of different people that look like all of our students. And Danielle, that is, that is a wise, wise answer that we should all hear. 
Ron, I'm going to shift to you and I'm going to rephrase one of the original questions we had here, um, which was what is the biggest challenge for teacher candidates to overcome to become successful full-time teachers, but as, as an administrator in a school district, and then Katie and Brian, I really want to hear from you guys on this one next, um, but what is, what is the, the things that, that are in place that help our new teachers or our student teachers uh, be most successful as quickly as possible uh, in your experience? Well, the first, the first year is always the toughest. Um, outside the student teaching experience, there's not a whole lot that can really prepare you for taking over a classroom. Uh, however, when the focus is what's in, in your classroom is on what's best for kids, you know, challenges don't go away, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. Um, I find that when students take priority in the classroom, building relationships is much easier and students generally want to be there. And when, when your students want to be in your class, generally they will be more successful, which makes you in turn a more successful teacher. So it's about relationships. It's about more than just content. It's, it's not about us, it's about the kids. Awesome, thanks. Katie, Brian? I would say, I, I think we see from our first year teachers when some of them are coming in, um, a lot of them have a good understanding of uh, developing student-centered lessons and what that means and what that looks like. Um, so they come in with that knowledge and I think they also come in with a better understanding of the need to diversify some of their lessons um, to be make sure that they are engaging all students, um, minority students included, because they've had more, I think, some more training in that area than some of our more veteran teachers, because that wasn't something that was as ingrained in the programs. So I would say those are the two biggest things that I notice. I'd echo everything that Katie and Ron just said. And I think, and I'm thinking back to a conversation that we just had with a, a new teacher who was feeling a little overwhelmed um, to really pinpoint the importance of focusing on relationships with kids. If you know your kids, you're then able to identify books that they want to read. You're able to support their writing. You're able to support their math. You know, that relationship is so important to that student dynamic or that, that culture in the classroom. But at the same time, helping them identify what's kind of the, the extra and like, all right, here's the core and kind of focus on this. And then all right, as, as you get experience, you'll kind of build into the other things. But relationships and here's kind of the things to kind of focus to get you going. And then you can build up to the other things throughout your experience. So I want to jump in and, and make a comment first, and then I'm going to ask a follow-up question of the group. And the, the comment I want to make is Katie's comment, I think, was, was really helpful, I hope, for our post-secondary folks to hear, because um, that's maybe a sign of, of the work being done at the community college and the university level heading in the right direction, um, to hear that more and more in her experience and in their experience in 204, more and more of their new teachers come in and are pretty good at designing student-centered lessons and learning environments right from, from day one. I mean, that's, that's a huge shift right there from, again, to Katie's point, um, not blaming all of us who, who were teachers uh, many years ago originally, um, but, but it was what we experienced and what certainly those people who were teaching us at that time uh, experience themselves as, as pre-service teachers. Um, the, the other thing we've heard from everybody that works in a school district setting right now has talked about the importance of building relationships with students. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have it with me, but this, this week, Education Week issued a, a more of a magazine versus its normal newspaper focus on SEL and teenagers. Um, and one of the themes, and there was one specific article, but one of the themes throughout it was that it couldn't be artificial. It had to be uh, authentic. And if it wasn't, uh, middle school and high school students would see through that immediately and, and really reject it. And so what advice do, would you give both to teachers directly for being authentic in how they build those relationships or for university leaders, community college leaders, and school district leaders for how we help support teachers in doing that authentically. So anybody feel free to jump in, but I think that's really a critical question because we've heard how key that is to 
uh, success for new teachers? I think specifically for new teachers, I think the big thing is for them to understand that nobody expects it to be perfect and that it's okay to make mistakes. And no matter how long you've done this job, that's what happens. It's what you do with the mistakes and how you learn from them and how you adjust. Um, this class, I mean, the way you teach something first period is not the way that it ends up being taught eighth period. And if you are teaching it the same way, then you haven't learned to adjust to your kids. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is, and I think that's also important that your kids see that you make mistakes um, because then they know it's okay to make mistakes as well. Um, the best advice I ever got my first year of teaching was, and I didn't even realize I did it, I screwed up something on a map when I was teaching world geography and my department chair happened to be there. And I apologized to the kids that I had messed up and fixed it and just kept going. And it was the first thing he said to me when I was finished that, do you understand how hard it is for a teacher to admit to kids that they've screwed up? But the amount of respect and credibility you gained by doing that in just 15 minutes. Um, so I think that's always stuck with me. So I think that's important. That's great. Other thoughts on how to support teachers with building those authentic relationships. Katie, that's a really specific one. And yes, we will make mistakes throughout our career every day, every year, because we're working with, with other human beings. I think, I think modeling it. Um, as much as we can uh, and making that a priority. I think that's a, that's a key component to it. I was gonna say that, you know, being with a background of early childhood, that relationships are really key in how we uh, teach children. And that, again, I mean, this has been brought up and that the way that kids learn from you is really through those interactions. You know, we know that television is not really going to teach them because it's, it's not interacting. And kids learn in the context of a relationship. And I don't think that changes as we get older. The teachers that we remember most from our school are the ones that seemed uh, seem to care the most for us. Now, some of the research and some of the research I have done has to look at what are quality programs, and a lot of them have to do with how attuned teachers are. Not everybody is going to be attuned, so I do think it has to also come in and in, in that we coach people, right, And but we can only teach them so much about building relationships and how they feel uh, uh, close to students, you know, or or whether they're able to read their cues, those kind of things, and, and actual interest. And, and some people may get into the job because uh, maybe because they think it's easy, you know, and then they realize how challenging it is, that it's not as easy as what they thought. But I do think a, a key part of, of what we observe in students, and we, we have a disposition system, and it's not to say, hey, you're not going to make it, but I think it's really important that we say, hey, we're seeing some struggles here. What's going on and how can we support you? So that's what it really is for. Maybe we need to name it something else, you know, but but the key part is making sure that we're spotting issues early on and that we're coming in and we're, we're supporting them because some of the things that Katie and Brian are talking about and Ron and, is that that is not going to get better if we don't step in and, and if we're not monitoring that. And, and the teachers that we're putting out there is really, really important that they are successful, right? Because they're going to speak to the field. They're going to spread the word. And so if we can help people along the way, I think that's gonna go a long way in making sure that they can be successful. Someone else was gonna jump in too. So please go ahead and do that. Thank you, Stacy. If not, I will jump in and say this that I've thought of a few times. I will never forget the, um, I, had a, I had the same teacher for three or four years of social science. And uh, I will never forget one day after class chatting, I, my must've been early in my senior year of high school. And there was no way even when I graduated high school that I was gonna become a teacher. But clearly what he said uh, embedded itself there. And, and Mr. Youngblood said, you know, this is really a great job. And he listed three or four reasons why it's a great job. And some of what Stacy just said echoed that, that again, one of the things that we need to do, and this was Katie's point, that we're our own uh, not best advocates a lot of times as educators, we, we want to go about and push our kids out there and have them be in the spotlight. And so to solve this, 
um, we need to probably do a little bit more of that. And maybe that's one thing as, as leaders, uh, particularly for those of us that are working as school and district leaders, <coughs> excuse me, is encouraging our teachers to, to be real active about doing that. And um, some of that happens on Twitter with people posting, you know, really exciting things that they're doing. But by and large, they're posting that for other educators. And that's important too, so we can learn from each other, but that's, that's not necessarily where their students are gonna learn from them or where their, their parents of their students are gonna say, oh, this is what's going on. So with that said, what, what are some specific things we can do? I mean, we heard Danielle kind of lead us there when it comes to the diversity of the teacher candidate pool, and that's making sure we're hiring diverse people in our schools uh, to work in a variety of different roles. Uh, and, and probably along with that, I would add, helping everybody in our school buildings, especially at the building level, think of themselves as an educator, even if they're, if they're not in a teaching role um, and how they contribute to that. So that a student who has those interactions with a parapro, a secretary, a custodian, a nurse can, can think of it broadly as, as an educational role and, and see themselves in that light. And then we also know we have these needs I mentioned earlier in specific areas um, bilingual teachers, special education teachers, uh, particularly for low incidence uh, kinds of needs, um, all the supported special education staff, like school psychologists, social workers, OTs, PTs, um, and then again, you layer bilingualism on top of, of any of those areas as being critical, CTE. What are the, the things that you either have thought of, you're doing in your various programs, or that you want to do, um, that you think can help us address those more specific candidate needs with regards to area role as an educator or the diversity of our, of our background. I don't have anything necessarily specific. Um, as educator numbers as a whole grow and get, and get better, I believe a lot of these hard fill areas will also be filled. I, I don't remember in the past, you know, prior to the education sh educator shortage in Illinois, specific areas that were in dire need before that very, very long. Um, with, with, with large numbers of, of people entering the field, those, those various um, areas, specific areas get, seem to get filled. Um, but, um, you know, just with our um, with our education pathway, the 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 idea is to grow our own and give kids experiences while they're here uh, that will help them choose education as a as a as a field, and then hopefully come back to us. Um, we currently have around twenty six percent of our uh, certified staff are alumni of Rock Falls High School, and to me that you know growing our own and and continuing that. I think can can do nothing but benefit us in all areas. And I want to piggyback on what Ron said. I'm a huge believer that experience makes the difference. Uh, students don't know what they don't know. And so, you know, they know kindergarten through 12. Maybe they are not a special education student. They don't know what it means to be part of a pullout program or a self-contained program. And experience, even observation experiences in those types of classrooms can be life-changing. Um, and, and I'm also, you know, the impetus has to be on us as well to, to point that out to our students. You know, you're a bilingual student just naturally. <laughs> wow, we can use you. Who doesn't want to be used? I mean, well, not used. Who doesn't want to be wanted, right? And so I just think uh, those experiences, if we can have those for students, provide those for students in high school, it's a much clearer path in post-secondary. Post-secondary doesn't always uh, have that opportunity. And so I'm a huge believer that the, you know, even if it's for a couple of times in multiple classrooms, uh, you know, the teacher in fourth grade on the right side of the hall teaches differently than the teacher in fourth grade on the left side of the hall. So the more experiences we can provide in our pathway in high school, the better it's going to be for our teachers. Yeah, and I think I'm going to, as I was listening to 
to Janice talk about again, how we have to get students outside of our own experiences. I was thinking about part of what Danielle said about how young people are thinking about things about careers that seem flashy or exciting or how much money they're gonna make. And I'll never forget that in that conversation I referenced, Mr. Youngblood said in that conversation, and his wife was a, was a teacher also, a middle school world languages teacher. He said, we're not rich, but we're very comfortable. He said, I take vacations. I have time to do that. I get a coach. My job during the day is fun. And then that's extra fun. I mean, so he really, he really sold that. And again, I walked out of there shaking my head and laughing at him. And, you know, two years later, um, was telling my parents, oh, by the way, I'm going to change my major. And I think one important thing to add, I will never forget that conversation either. Um, they were both teachers and they said, no, you, why would you want to do that? Um, and so that's, someone said that earlier on this call that we are in this, in this panel, we do that and, and we have to stop doing that. Um, and that alone won't solve our teacher shortage overnight, but it will, it will help get us there. Um, other, other ideas about solving these specific needs in particular areas or related to the diversity of all of us as educators across the state. So we look uh, more like our, our students are. Oh, Isn't I was, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Katie, or go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I heard someone say something about value. And so when going into the community and identifying value, telling people, like you said, wow, you're already bilingual, did you ever think? And then once that conversation starts, talk about maybe why you didn't think if you didn't, and, and what is that, you know, not to use the word barrier in the conversation, but identify the barrier and remove it one way or another. Get, get those innovative ideas going and in place to then allow those community members that have the value to return to the same space because um, Danielle spoke so eloquently about having someone look like you teach you makes all the difference in the world. That's step one in establishing that relationship just in that context. And um, so I, I really think finding, I believe that going into the community and doing that reach out at, to our young people, to our other community workers, to our people in the spaces, as Danielle said, how can we flip our paras? to professional educators? How can we flip our, you know, and, and use those people already in the spaces with so much to give to their school and to their, their future, their future, their students coming through those spaces? How can we support that? Those kinds of things I think are going to be the way that we begin to make that change to fill those, those needs. Um, I also think that, because uh, I work with a CT who doesn't look like her students, but the way that I think she reaches to them in a very, like, in a very, like, night, in a very, like, motherly way, she has her own children, but she, off, like, her classroom is very values-driven, so in a lesson, she may include a lesson about working hard, even when it isn't easy, like, she, or if it's, um, uh, regarding, I know we talked about history recently, like history is always a subject that tends to bring up some maybe not so positive topics, but having lessons about things that, you know, may not be like, that are, that are good to hear. So I think that a values driven classroom can also play a big role in that. And I see that a lot with teachers today is that they're not just teaching the, the, the child's brain, but you know, their heart and the little human they're going to become or whichever or bigger depending on the grade level. But of course, I think that so even if a, a teacher is not the same as their student in appearance, having the, uh, you know, the decision to add values into your classroom, whatever makes sense for that classroom, of course, is everyone is different, I think can go a large like leaps and bounds towards so showing them that you care about their future and their and what that becomes, but yeah. Danielle, I love that you said that because that's one of the things that we talk about now is that how do we prepare our teachers who don't look like their students meet the needs of those students? Um, because until we have that pipeline of diverse teacher candidates in our spaces, we need to be sure that we're preparing our current teachers to meet the needs of the students that they're going to have in their classrooms. So I'm happy to hear that you're seeing that being modeled. Brian, before we wrap up, did you have something you wanted to add? 
Uh, that's hard to follow, Danielle. I think she said it so nicely that uh, I don't want to steal her space because she talked about it so well and how to support our students who are becoming future educators. Well, and, and it's funny because I was going to ask Danielle at the end to, to kind of give us that as a, as a parting thought. So Danielle, thank you for doing that. And with that said, we're, we're just about at time here. And so one thing I want to mention is obviously we've talked about the importance of teacher relationships with students in, in being important for student success. As I was thinking about it, I think that's important for teacher success also, and for teachers to then stay in the profession once in the profession. The other thing that we've touched on is, is the idea of mentoring. And we've heard, I mean, Katie talked about the innovative new ISBE IEA IFT joint um, virtual coaching, virtual mentoring program that we now have statewide. And so Katie, thank you for talking about that. And as I was thinking about that, um, I was again thinking earlier about the, the benefits of mentoring, not just to the new teacher, but to the experienced teacher, right? And it keeps us fresh and it requires us to think in new ways. And I wanna believe that by being a mentor, that's gonna be more likely to keep our experienced teachers, not only in the profession, but engaged in growing in the profession. And one of our participants sent a, a message to the chat directly to me. And I, I think this is relevant to that mentoring conversation. And probably again, a good thing for us to remind all of our experienced teachers, uh, or anybody working with a student teacher or a student who's observing in a classroom. Um, and the best advice I heard for a mentor of new teachers was to remember that when you are feeling so busy that you don't have time for your mentor or your mentee, excuse me, that's when your mentee needs you the most. And so I think it's also incumbent on those of us in school district leadership positions, think about how we create that time for, for everybody to have it when they don't feel like they have it. So there's a lot of layers, I think, of specific things that we can do from going out in our communities um, like both the SIU Grow Your Own and the NIU programs are doing in different ways um, to making people feel wanted for all the skills they already have and bringing those into our schools and, and enriching our schools through that and then through all these specific things. So I just want to thank all of our panelists. You're doing extraordinary work up and down throughout Illinois. And um, thank you all, Danielle. We wish you the best of luck as a group for everything you represent in solving this teacher shortage. And we wanna remind everybody, we will be posting this on YouTube and we have a few more weeks of fall meetings. So uh, please join us for focus on equity and a focus on the career pathways uh, on November 5th and November 12th. So thanks again, everybody.